So welcome, Andre. Um, I don't know, I was fascinated uh, in perhaps in the wrong saying, but that voice. Uh, but um, here we are to discuss philosophical health, philosophical counseling. Uh, and you are yourself practicing philosophical counseling, if yeah. I'm correct. And uh, I think the first thing I'd like to know is how how you came to philosophy and then how you came to philosophical counseling. Well, I, uh, I started uh, studying philosophy when I was uh, young, 19 years old, 20 years old. Uh, at the time, I wanted to, uh, to enroll in some arts program, but not so much. I, I also had a, a passion for theory, so philosophy was uh, my choice. And that uh, took me to a PhD program, eventually a PhD mm. program in uh, philosophy and uh, phenomenology especially. Right. Uh, but after that the PhD program, I, I felt the need for something practical as well. So mm. that's when I found out about uh, Oscar Brenifier and I enrolled in his uh, school mm -hmm. in Paris. Right. Uh, the training in uh, philosophical counseling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, four, and, and, hmm? four years ago, four years ago. So, okay. And, and then you started practicing in uh, Romania. Yes. Okay. Yes. How, how is it working for you and how, what kind of um, situations in general, what is your general impression uh, after? So you've been practicing in the last three years or yes. four years? Yes, yes. And uh, well, I, uh, I, now I teach at a couple of universities especially at the Polytechnic University in Bucharest. And uh, besides uh, the teaching job, I uh, uh, have some uh, students for uh, philosophical counseling, philosophical practice, and uh, critical thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, the situation is developing here. So we're still in the stage of um, promoting this idea of uh, philosophical right. counseling, mm. why they should do it, uh, what they can uh, get out of it, uh, Right. So uh, this is uh, still, uh, we're still in an early stage in Romania. Mm. Right. And I mean, I think we are in early stages more or less everywhere, although we know that in Germany, uh, the US, uh, Norway, and Israel, uh, they have been practicing for now maybe uh, two decades or so or maybe even a bit more, uh, with ups and downs. Uh, for example, Norway, I think that they were very strong. They even had a, a, a training in philosophical counseling that was uh, connected to a university. And that sort of uh, dissolved and, and there is no, no much, not much happening there. So, what I find, uh, we started more or less at the same time. Uh, I started also uh, uh, three and a half years ago in Sweden, uh, firstly uh, in real life, uh, and now more, uh, more, I do more sessions online. But I, I, do, I do think that, um, I mean, I was, I was surprised that there is really a, a need people are there seems to be at least a part of society that finds it extremely relevant and this leads me to my other question and of course you can always uh, you can also ask questions right this is not i'm not a journalist so i'm not a yes. i'm only partly interviewing you uh but um yeah, I, I think that sometimes I think what kind of people come to me and they might be from different um, backgrounds in terms of perception of well-being, right? So you might have people that live with a diagnose, uh, even that might be uh, uh, have a, um, a treatment, a psychiatric treatment for depression or, or what have you. And on the other hand, you might have people who actually are successful but want 
or or experience themselves as success or the one to have some sense of more um uh meaning purpose uh, in life um, and uh, but i find that there is something in common uh which is people who like to process information let's say by intellectual means as opposed to emotional means right yeah do you have the same uh, impression yes uh, um most of my students from the philosophical practice uh, come from a, uh, let's say, a non-pathological uh, background. So they, they didn't have a psychotherapy or if they had psych mm. psychotherapy, it was not uh, psychiatric. Mm. Uh, well, they're rather well. Mm. Right. They're, uh, they're well. Uh, they have just have some curiosities regarding uh, reflection regarding philosophy some of them uh, are passionate of going to different uh, courses mm. and after trying this and that they stumble upon philosophical practice and they they enjoy it for instance i have a, a group i've been working with them for about uh, one year and a half and we're still going uh, mm. we're, we're even uh, discovering uh, different philosophies together and working mm. on them and uh, they I think they stick around right. for, uh, for the exploration part. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mean that you are doing uh, group sessions or are you also doing individual sessions? Both individual and, uh, and group session, mostly individual sessions. But now, for instance, uh, I'm uh, starting a group session with my uh, frequent collaborator, in, uh, mm. uh, Anka Tiuran, who is a psychotherapist. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing both. Right. And so I know that you are uh, particularly fond of phenomenology. You just published the phenomenology of elegance, which is a beautiful uh, uh, phrase. Uh, can you tell us more about both? Actually, both. I'm curious about both. How do you, why do you see phenomenology as being an important uh, tool for philosophical health and and what about elegance well phenomenology has some uh, very nice epistemological tools which uh, the counselor can use uh, the most famous uh, tool from uh, Husserlian phenomenology is the epohe or bracket you, you suspend your judgment mm -hmm. suspend right. your ideas and in short you you stop projecting this is very useful for the, the counselor because you, mm. as a counselor, you stop projecting your ideas onto the client and, mm. well, give the client some space to express himself or herself, right. to, to think and to, well, not have uh, his or her thoughts disrupted by, by the counselor. Mm. Uh, the phenomenology of elegance, well, it was an experiment of mine. Uh, I initially uh, was very passionate about the phenomenology of body and movement. This is a very fashionable subject in the cognitive sciences, embodiment, yeah. and uh, I got into this uh, phenomenology of movement. And then the question was, well, what should I do with this mm -hmm. phenomenology of movement? And at the time, I was uh, also into fashion and clothes and uh, uh, beauty okay uh, so i said okay let's uh, let's try to do this mm -hmm. and that became my uh, initial uh, phd program oh, then yeah. I, I i went to italy to to study with a, a very good uh, philosopher roberta de monticelli and mm -hmm. uh, she, she actually she gave me this uh, this idea of elegance because at the time mm -hmm. i was wandering around with the phenomenology of movement, volition. I was not very sure. And she, she told me about this, uh, this thing. What about elegance? Mm. Interested in both phenomenology, right. the body, the experience of the body, and uh, the clothed body, mm. dressed up body. And uh, then, um, well, she suggested it. And some years after the PhD, the book came out. It was uh, great have the book finally finished mm -hmm. 
have the experiment yeah. finished. Um, it reminds me when you speak about elegance, um, I think about Kleist's uh, book, uh, The Theatre of Puppets, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You probably mentioned it in your book. Um, this beautiful idea, I think it's Deleuze who, who, who brings it in his, uh, as a philosophical character. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there is this idea of, there is two friends and one of them is tying his shoelace, putting his feet on the chair and starts tying the shoelace. And the other friend says, wow, this was the most elegant gesture I've seen. And of course, then the friend tries to reproduce that, but it, 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 it fails. It's totally unnatural. And, and, it's, uh, and so then there is this idea that the puppets are, uh, the, the marionettes are, are the most elegant beings because in fact, they are just being acted by by a flow that they they don't uh, try to control um what's is is elegance where is elegance in that i mean it's a field that i don't know so i'm just uh improvising here but in this uh continuum between let's say control and 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 naturality right it, yeah. it, that seems to be a an important dialectic. Yeah, oh. that's a that's a nice example. With the marionette being flooded by uh, control from uh, from the outside and thus making it uh, elegant. Well, uh, a big uh, theory about uh, elegance comes from uh, Castiglione, from uh, the Renaissance, mm. and uh, in between this uh, control on the on the one hand and uh, uh, lack of control or uh, Mm -hmm. flexibility on the other elegance would go more towards uh, flexibility towards uh, an idea that when uh, when you're flexible i mean when you get rid of your own rigidity of your, mm -hmm. your own resistance to to the world you get this uh, elegant appearance mm -hmm. and uh, uh, besides this uh, elegance also appears when you learn something uh, but you do not appear to have uh, put great effort into learning. Right. So right. It, it seems natural, even though there was some resistance there, there was some, uh, some effort right. going on. Is this the idea of sprezzatura, right? The idea right. that we're making actually something very sophisticated and that took a lot of training, but at, after a, a certain point, it looks uh, virtuoso or natural. Yeah. Yes, it, it, you've trained so much, it, it doesn't seem that you've trained at all. Right. This mm. is the yeah. nonchalance. Yeah, I think that, that's, I like, I relate very much to this idea of freedom being the result of uh, experience and, and training and work. And this is something that I think that... Um, a lot of people today would benefit from, right? Because we have this capitalist idea of freedom as being this sort of a uh, inert capacity to choose and and um, basically right. spontaneous uh, disorder or, or. But what about style then? Because isn't so? This is a little bit what we're talking about, right? It's so yeah. style would be the result the sort of the emergent result of a long work or i mean yeah a long a long uh, uh attention yeah. to a, a constellation of ideas which relates for me uh, very much with the kind of work i do as a philosophical counselor and uh the way we met is that you 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 commented on on what uh, uh, you thought was was a bit intriguing when I speak about philosophical conviction, right? Yes. And um, so I may I may clarify it vaguely quickly, but I do believe that there are two times uh, in my approach, at least I use at least two important moments of the philosophical 
uh, healing process or, or is like the first one is a sort of a deconstruction uh, where we indeed uh, analyze certain rigidities that might actually contain contradictions, etc. And we sort of reconnect with what I call the creel, which is the singularity of the cosmos, this sort of a um, uh, creative flow that is uh, shared by many other process philosophers. But at the same time, oh, uh, and this can in, imply a lot of critique on one hand, and the other hand, what you were saying about the epoch, the and the, the pause of projection, which I call deep listening. All right, okay. And, and uh, but uh, there is another moment where I try to help people construct a, a, a coherent and yodynamic uh, conceptual constellation. This is what I call the philosophical conviction. It's something that is, of course, a plastic and, and, uh, and uh, that, that contains a, a certain flexibility, but uh, that is not a pure, uh, let's say, um, floating acceptance of, of where there is without a, a, a sort of a, a structure, let's say, a, a conceptual structure, which is not based on, ideally, of course, a dogmatism, but based on, again, a, the idea of a conceptual integrity, the idea that there might be, uh, for some people, and I do believe there is, a, an explicit way of organizing our life around a, a set of ideas, values, notions that might be between four and eight. That's what I call the, that's why I call it a constellation. But that constellation itself, and that's actually engineers know, I work a lot with uh, engineers too uh, in, in consulting, and I find them actually very open to, to yeah. uh, these ideas. So in engineering, you have this idea of structural integrity, right? Of a, of a, a bridge or a construction. And yeah. you know that if you build things too rigid, they break. You're right. So yeah. you, not, you need to have actually a structure uh, that, that has some flexibility such that it holds. So that's, wh that's what I mean uh, by philosophical conviction, because I do believe that we most people are implicitly uh, um, traversé in French. They are implicitly moved by uh, ideologies, by by convictions that that might not be theirs. Uh, and so that was uh, yeah. So that's the kind of approach I I I associate to the idea of philosophical belief but i i also have noticed that it is something that might not be for everyone let's say like like some people are more or less in demand or need of a um a structuration that allows for regularity and i'll finish here because i'm being a bit long but i do think that I wrote uh, in the book that you mentioned, being a nearness, I have the sort of minimal cosmology. And uh, uh, between this, this sort of dual uh, phen phenomenon or dual uh, ontology around the creel and the one, the multiple and the one, or we could say regularity and singularity, or the creel and the real. And I do believe that on the side of the real, in order to make worlds, a life world, you need regularities. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's the that's only one side of, and you also need singularities. You also need uh, this flow. You also need this this connection with freedom. In otherwise, it, it becomes uh, too rigid. So, I think that in order to to help people have a good life, you need to work on both uh, on both sides the um yeah the singularity side co-creation and the regularity side uh some sort of uh yeah philosophical constellation okay so uh, basically you propose 
this uh, conviction as a um, discovery of uh, one's own uh, concepts, this uh, constellation that you, you name it as such. And uh, uh, sometimes uh, you encourage them also to have a, a moment of, uh, let's say, innovation or a, a daring to, to get out of their scheme that they discovered through reflection. Yeah, we could say it like that. All right. Well, yeah, it, it makes sense. Hmm. Right. And so uh, coming back to your training, so you had a training with um, Oscar Bonafier, right? Am I pronouncing his name correctly? Uh, I don't know uh, his work very well, but I, I heard a little bit about him. And I, it seems that he favors more the Socratic approach, right? He focuses a lot on uh, shaking people's dogmatism. Uh, uh, how would you define that? Yes, the, the Socratic method is uh, very provocative. Uh, and because of that, um, well, some people need to, to have a philosophical organ of some kind to uh, enjoy the process more than uh, the initial uh, encounter with uh, a Socratic figure. The Socratic mm. figure uh, in Plato dialogues as well, uh, the Socratic figure was uh, a bit violent for them. This is why the they, Greeks. This is why they killed him. Mm. He was, uh, well, he was annoying to them. Right. Uh, stirring up their, mm. their, their beliefs and proving to them that, well, every belief can have a reverse side. Mm. The idea has uh, its limits. Mm. So uh, this is uh, true for, uh, for Oscar Brenifier's uh, method, mm. which, I, uh, which I apply and I practice. Okay. So this means that, um, by the way, what do you mean by philosophical organ? Um, uh, an openness to discussing ideas without uh, uh, trying to settle mm. discussion uh, very fast. So right. the, the sort of openness or passion towards uh, never-ending discussions. Okay. And it's interesting that you use a biological metaphor for that. Yes, yes. Uh, the, maybe this comes from a uh, Romanian, we have this expression, uh, an organ for mathematics, an organ oh, okay. for, Interesting. for uh, the theology, for okay. philosophy. All right. Hmm. That's, I think that's beautiful. I think that also connects with your interest in the phenomenology of the body, right? I do tend to, I, I often say that for me, thinking is as important as breathing for a human being. So it sort of connects with that, uh, the physiology, which is a very Nietzschean theme also, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think that for the listeners, I think that uh, it's clear in the genealogy of the idea of philosophical health, I think that Nietzsche is a very important figure, as you know. Right. Uh, he, he had this idea that indeed uh, the separation, the dualism between body and mind is, is, is an illusion and therefore uh, philosophy and physiology are, are perhaps the two sides of the same coin uh, in Nietzsche's um, approach. Coming back to um, the provocative, um okay but let's say that i mean I, I more and more i tend to think that um there's a book actually that was published by cambridge university press which is called intellectual uh shamans and um and i i think it's a great title the book is perhaps uh, uh, not so uh, fascinating, in fact, but the title is fantastic because the more I practice, the more I see myself uh, perhaps um, uh, without enough modesty as someone who is a healer uh, of the souls or helps people 
a doctor of the soul. Yeah, but the term healer is is more important because we know that if we say doctor today, the bi biomedical model is so important that we start thinking about measuring and 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 a healer is precisely a person that is very suspicious about measuring and statistics and norms. A healer is a person who sees your singularity. Yeah. And and so in that sense, uh, in the sense of uh, what I've called uh, with Deleuze, uh, um, the sorcerer, with the source being right with a U, like a source, but also. So if we are just provocative, if we are just Socratic, uh, and I understand the political importance of that, but isn't it too violent for some people who need a little bit of care? You know, it's it's like it's like the the things that handle with with care. You know, when we have a, a yeah. porcelain or something, fragile people. Yeah, I, I mean they're not fragile by necessarily by nature. They might have a fragile moment in their life, and my practice is that I see that some people at some moments they need they are very fine and they actually need a more provocative approach and even with humor and and that's perfect and at other moments uh it's much more it needs to be much more caring and and soft and i would i have a problem with applying a mode and actually i have that problem with any form of philosophical counseling because other forms are for example let's focus on logic and people have, uh, right, Eliot D. Cohen, who I, I respect a lot. And I think all these things are good puzzles. And But if we are too much on the logic side, I say, oh, let's look only at the logical fallacies that this person applied. Uh, so I think that's the challenge with philosophical counseling is that uh, Perhaps it's the discipline, since I think philosophy is, is, is the only discipline, I mean, is the, the discipline by excellence that looks both at the whole and the singular, so these right. two extremes, yeah. right? Uh, if we apply that in counseling, it might be, in fact, incompatible with a too rigid uh, theory, like we can have a meta methodology, right? Uh, what do you think about that? Well, uh, Oscar has a very nice uh, concept of uh, mirroring, which is true for uh, the Socratic method and for Socrates as well. Because we know this, uh, this Socrates that provoked people, that uh, annoyed some people and got him killed. But also in, uh, in the dialogues, we also have uh, Socrates that is very nice to, to some students, for instance, in uh, the Republic. Uh, Glaucon frequently struggles with himself and uh, with his own uh, thinking. And uh, Glaucon knows it, Socrates knows it. And whenever Glaucon has some trouble or whenever Ademantos had some, uh, some trouble, uh, Socrates supports them and tells them, go on, uh, finish your idea, go on, don't, right. let, your, don't let yourself uh, bog down because mm. of your uh, emotions on that subject. So right. uh, he, he, he mirrors his uh, interlocutors in a way mm. in which, well, if the interlocutor becomes uh, violent or becomes uh, uh, pissed off because uh, of what he discovers in reflection, then Socrates as well mirrors this. Okay. The hope of um, making mm. interlocutor aware okay. of, uh, of himself. But if uh, the interlocutor needs some uh, care, then uh, Socrates also becomes uh, a bit more right. caring. Mm. And that I sounds fascinating. This, yeah. I saw this also in uh, Oscar, for instance. He. Uh, with some uh, some people, he's uh, very uh, well a bit rough because mm -hmm. the people have uh, some dilemmas, and he wants to make them aware of mm -hmm. their rigidity, of their uh, violence, of their right. uh, aggression towards themselves. 
but in other cases, when he works with the children, well, he well, he's very nice. He, okay. Uh, so children get a special treatment. And I, I, I think it's fascinating, this idea of mirroring, could, but I, I might have a problem with it because uh, so... Isn't that what Israelis and Palestinians are doing? They are mirroring each other. Isn't that what, when couple fights? I mean, I don't know. You you have you are in perhaps in couple or married. Uh, if you respond to insult by insult, it's not necessarily always the best approach. Yeah. Well, uh, we don't insult <laughs> clients. <laughs> you don't insult. You know, actually, I read that um, uh, this was many years ago, uh, and I think it was in Romania. Yeah. There was a psychanal a young psychanalyst that became very famous because he actually was extremely rude with his patients. And, and there was an article about it even in France. And um, I don't know if that rings a bell, but I, I found that very amusing uh i i haven't tried it uh, though i would i wouldn't advise people to try it uh, uh, at home if, uh, if, the, if the client uh, gets uh, um, violent or starts uh, insulting then uh, that's a very nice um, uh, situation in which we try to reflect on how did we get here why <laughs> why did this uh, why did you you told me why why did you say those very harsh things about me right so uh, right. we're always in a, a reflective mode mm. i have <laughs> to say i haven't had that experience yet uh have you had that experience of um, one of your students that started being violent during um, a counseling session no 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 not so Right. Well, it, some it, of them get uh, get a, a bit uh, annoyed, hmm. but uh, uh, I usually deal with uh, humor. Okay. So uh, instantly we get out of uh, the dialogue hmm. and uh, try to look at the dialogue with some uh, some humor, hmm. using an analogy or uh, right. a famous character, funny character from a uh, universal literature. Mm -hmm. something like that for example for can you, example, can you give us an a, example of that uh, if uh, anonymous example of a situation like that well i have a, a student who's uh, very enthusiastic about many things mm. but he wants to discover many things and fast he he's a uh, fond of uh, newness new stuff all right. this new stuff and uh, sometimes he he gets frustrated because uh, this uh, makes him uh, be more superficial he starts something and then he goes to something else and uh, starts reading the third book and then uh, starts seeing a movie and doesn't finish all of mm. these because he's always right all over the place mm. and uh, the analogy here uh, is uh, don giovanni Right, jumps from one woman to another. Right, so this is kind of a Don mm. Giovanni, intellectually speaking. Okay, Don Giovanni of books, never fully consuming a relation with a relationship with a book or a movie or mm. an intellectual endeavor. Mm. And well, when mentioning uh, this uh, character, well, do you know D Don Giovanni? Oh, yes, of course, I know Don Giovanni. Well, uh, does it make sense to have something of uh, Don Giovanni in this uh, uh, being passionate about new stuff, behavior? Oh, yeah, uh, I guess it makes, a, makes some sense. Yeah, what's the connection? Well, then start thinking about it and uh, the frustration is replaced by... Um, being illuminated by the obvious mm -hmm. something that he knew he did but did not conceptualize right yeah there is a uh, an, an interesting book by a french psychoanalyst uh, lacanian uh jean-pierre vinter with, and the book is called the les errants the errants of flesh les errants de la chair 
uh, studies on uh, masculine uh, hysteria. And he, uh, he, he speaks a lot of Don Giovanni. Uh, we could say, uh, just for the anecdote, that Don Giovanni is also a little bit uh, obsessive compulsive and a monomaniac because he, he, uh, he, he stays focused on the same theme in a way. But uh, I like your, your idea of humor. That reminds me that Siddhartha, uh, uh, Herman Hesse, who, who is the author of Siddhartha, for example, uh, had this idea that humor is the, the final stage just before uh, enlightenment. Um, and and uh, it's, it's indeed a... Um, it could be a, a technique... Uh, Although here I think we are back to the idea of sprezzatura or, or, or elegance is like probably the real humor is not, you don't think about it, right? It's like you, uh, you even, yeah. perhaps you're funny without even trying. Yeah. yeah. Yes, humor is very important both in uh, Socrates and in uh, modern uh, philosophical mm. counseling because it's a way of abstracting and of distancing oneself from uh, from uh, mm. the discussion from the initial topic so when uh, people get too involved some humor detaches them mm. from uh, that emotional game that right. they started playing and that affects their uh, their thinking uh, i uh, i think lydia amir has uh, some uh, uh, good books on humor is a very okay. good uh, philosophical counselor mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. has uh, this idea that humor is very important for uh, the consultation. Okay. For philosophical practice in general. Right. Hmm. How do you see the future of um, philosophical health? Uh, how do you see things unfold both positively and in terms of Danger, perhaps, if any. Uh, the philosophical health uh, movement should get more uh, popular because uh, certainly it uh, covers some um, area of uh, people having this need for uh, clarification and for uh, exploration of uh, their own lives in a reflective way. So there is work to be done, that's for right. sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, the problem would be that uh, uh, well, we, we don't have such a strong community yet, and uh, this is uh, risky. Right. We, as in other uh, philosophical schools, people tended to uh, depart from one another, mm -hmm. and uh, collaboration was uh, not so good. Right. So uh, this would be a great risk for uh, mm -hmm. the philosophical health movement as a whole right i like that idea actually um i did my phd on on esprit de corps uh which is precisely the um the spirit of community of community of of practice community of belief epistemic community and uh, because right. um you know for many years i avoided academia i thought this would be um uh, the end of my creativity and and uh, and I was an independent author and and then at 40 I felt perhaps that I was strong enough to be an academic without losing uh my uh, my uh, you know my freedom well those are big words but you know uh and um and but I did my PhD on what I thought was both a menace and an opportunity because esprit de corps can be both this beautiful one mind between people who are looking at the same horizon, uh, but it can also be groupthink, right? And we see a lot of groupthink, which is basically a stubborn dogmatism of people who protect each other while excluding others. And we see that too. So. But I do agree, and that is shared by Ellie Kramer, with whom I'm going to have a conversation. He is into uh, uh, philosophy as way of life, which is um, very uh, uh, connect, a very uh, 
close to the idea of philosophical health. Uh, it focuses on Pierre Hadot and and Foucault and yeah. and um, and he also uh, uh, has a contribution to the book that we're putting together on philosophical health. And uh, Eli wants to uh, is in Poland at the moment, but he he really wants to create that sort of community. And I and I think perhaps we should. Uh, have a conversation with him because I think that's fundamental and that is done also by realizing that uh, despite the many approaches to philosophical counseling I think it's important that we we realize that we have the same vision and therefore yeah. that we should respect each other's methods I've heard I came to the movement uh, philosophical counseling uh, uh, later let's say that we are the second wave or uh, but i i heard that there's been in 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 the past already some intestine uh quarrels between i find this a little bit um uh unuseful especially when we are such a small uh niche uh, activity then it's great that there are many approaches and i think that we need to show to the world, otherwise we're not philosophically healthy, right? If we if we cannot uh, uh, learn from each other and, and be a diverse yet focused group, then uh, we would sort of prove uh, uh, pragmatically that we are not that philosophically healthy. So we'll see. Uh, I'm not a such a great marketing person, so... I, I'm trying to, through the philosophical health page and uh, this conversation, I'm trying to, you know, create, steer a little bit the spirit. Um, and I believe in slow growth too. Uh, everything is done persistently, but without forcing too much. And But, but I agree with you that um, we do need to have a better awareness that we are in it that we are a community actually uh, of, of belief and of practice, I'd say. Yes, this is uh, very important to be mm -hmm. part of a professional community, especially of uh, an international professional exactly. community. And uh, well, it's something uh, we uh, partially lack in Romania. We have an association, but the uh, things are uh, very slow. Mm -hmm. So uh, being part of a community of practitioners is, right. is great. We'll have uh, more conversations about that and uh, perhaps not so interesting at the moment for the, uh, the people who are listening to this recording, but um, off the record, we will uh, plan uh, how to conquer the world. <laughs> but... Um, Anything else you would like to add or, or ask uh, in the last five minutes? Well, at the moment, I have no idea. Okay. Well, I, uh, I want to thank you for uh, this, uh, this opportunity, for this uh, discussion that uh, we had and uh, can't wait for uh, the next one. Exactly. Well, for, thank you, Andre. Uh, it, was, it was lovely to talk. And uh, I will stop the recording, and now the real conversation will start. You know, just that was it. that was humor. <laughs>